Nerdy Pal. What's going on, everybody? Thank you for tuning in to Nerdy 430, the show where comedian Tim Keck and I talk about nerdy-ish things for 30-ish minutes. My name is Kevin Bauer, and today we are talking about Christmas action movies. When you're talking about Christmas action movies, there's nowhere else to go. You got to talk about Die Hard. And to do that, we brought in venerated Die Hard expert. You know him. You love him. Ladies and gentlemen, Matt Strickland. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for having me, guys. This is my favorite thing in the world to talk about. It's my favorite movie. I think it's the greatest action movie ever made. It's the greatest Christmas movie ever made. It's possibly the greatest movie ever made. Uh, So thank you for having me on to talk about it. Matt, we're thrilled to have you. And let me tell you, I think uh, Die Hard has penetrated your life to such a degree that you are doing something that I think is a perfect encapsulation of the entire character arc of John McClane, you are drinking simultaneously a hot coffee and an iced coffee. <laughs> I mean, this is the collision of New York and L.A. right here. I you am. You got your cold yeah, climate right. and warm climate. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's that's beautiful. I never I didn't think about it. But yeah, you're right. I am. I am diehard in human form. The, an and embodiment I of the duality barefoot. of man. <laughs> Yeah, Matt showed us his bare feet. We're all barefoot for this, right? Yeah, I got my absolutely. Yeah. We're my all socks barefoot, are off. making fists with our toes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> have any of you ever done that after a flight? I actually have. After watching this movie, it's. Uh, I've heard it is recommendation for like motion sickness as well, and it has never worked for me. <laughs> now, I, I, I'm doing it right now, and it is like nice. It's nice. My thing is the amount of time between being uncomfortable and scared on your flight and then you get in, you get off the airport, then you like wait for a car, then you get back to your hotel. And by the time you're finally barefoot on some carpet, like hours have passed and it's like, so what are you doing this from? How is this going to help you face your fear of flying? I know. And by that time, I'm wasted. You know? <laughs> by that time, Matt's been wasted for hours. <laughs> yeah. I like to get I like the person checking my ticket to be a little worried that I'm too drunk to find my seat. <laughs> That's how I like to be getting on a plane. You want the aura of a problem without actually being a problem. <laughs> exactly. I just want them to be concerned. I want them to like say to the flight attendant, OK, so just so you know, 23C he he might be an issue but then i'm but then i'm chill i feel like that's when you get the most love getting off the plane too because they're all like hey all right buddy yeah. how was your flight <laughs> just because they're so it. thrilled the relief in them is palpable the relief mm-hmm. of an alpha predator letting them slide <laughs> <laughs> A big enough man who was like, you could have taken this whole plane down if you wanted to, but you didn't. And we respect you for that. We respect you for your restraint. (laughs) It's powerful stuff. Speaking of powerful stuff, Matt, we like to do this every year. I mean, last year on a little podcast called Come At Me Show, which famously might make a return in 2022. We talked about Die Hard for an hour and a half on our uh, holiday episode. And uh, we covered a lot of ground. (laughs) Yeah, not long enough, though, which is why we're back. (laughs) And also could have done more Uh, Mm -hmm. this year. This year, I'm I'm excited to talk to you about Die Hard again, as I always want to. I watched it again. Did you rewatch it for this pod? Did anything new pop up to you? Did you get a new take from this? So I didn't rewatch it um, because, uh, you know, I like to watch it every year. I mean, I probably watch it a couple times a year, but during the Christmas season, I like to watch it, obviously. But I like to wait a little till a little bit closer to Christmas. Uh, But I did think I um, had seen it. You know, I've seen this movie over 100 times. so uh, (laughs) I did not rewatch it for this, but I was thinking about it and I was just like because I didn't know, you know, exactly what we're going to get into today. And I was just trying to think about like, what are some things that are like. I just think this movie has such underrated supporting characters because obviously you got Bruce Willis, classic action hero. You got Hans Gruber, I would argue greatest action movie villain, one of the greatest movie villains ever. Those are your your your, your titans. Those are the, the leads. They're great. Undeniable. But what makes Die Hard so good, or one of the reasons, is Ellis, is Theo is Argyle is, you know, the, the, the Johnson and Johnson FBI guys like these 
guys who come in for maybe two, three scenes and they just, you know, Bill Simmons on that rewatchables, he's always talking about like the Dion Waiters award. It's just, this movie is just an entire second unit of Dion Waiters coming <laughs> in and just like catching fire and hitting threes. Cause I mean, Ellis is one of the greatest. I love the character of Ellis so much. He's so fucking funny and sleazy and he has so all the great, I mean, so many great lines. It's just, I love the supporting characters in Die Hard really help elevate it, I think. It feels to me kind of like wrestling or something like that, where like as a kid, I'm like, oh, so and so is a bad guy. They're terrible. I hate them. And like when I first saw Die Hard, I remember being like, oh, Ellis, he's the worst. He's terrible. And now that I'm older, I'm like, you know, damn, this actor's crushing. I'm like, dang, I hate this guy. So like, I love how much I hate this guy as opposed to just unadulterated, pure hatred. You know, he's he's amazing. Yeah. He's so awful. He's amazing. It's great. He's such a perfect fucking scumbag. And he's like, he has all those notes where it's like uh, he you hear the sirens coming when John finally gets the cops to come. And uh, he like turns to John's wife and he goes, wow, I never thought I'd like to hear that sound. <laughs> Just so it's like you fucking asshole. You've never been in trouble with the cops before in your life. It's so funny too. Like when I was, I first, you know, I saw this movie the very first time I saw Die Hard. I was like 11 years old. I was staying at my aunt and uncle's house. They took me to the video store to rent a movie. And I was like, this is great. I'm going to rent a rated R movie that I like wouldn't normally be allowed to rent. Rent to Die Hard changed my life. Greatest thing ever. <laughs> but I definitely, the first time, I did not know. Cause they, they, it's, it's not exactly subtle, but it's subtle. If you're 11, how Ellis is doing Coke constantly <laughs> yeah. like, throughout the movie. <laughs> it's just like every scene it cuts to him. He's just like, sn like, it's like just after he took a bump <laughs> and it's, uh, so good. I would love it if that actor committed that to being his like Brad Pitt always eating thing. Every oh, scene yeah. is, <laughs> we're getting him on the recoil <laughs> off a bump. Yeah, it, it, it's weird when he played the dad in Little Women, but you know, he's, <laughs> that's his, his trademark. He just kept itching his nose the whole time. <laughs> Kevin, we've gotten into some arguments before about the hero's journey. Yes. And uh, how, you know, we're both big fans of it. Fans of uh, Dan Harmon's writing style and that whole progression. And in the past, I've argued that John Die Hard is always the example that people use for the hero's journey. And I was like, I don't really I don't really get it. I guess I kind of get it. Upon this rewatch, I did notice some things that kind of made me rethink it. But do you want to go through uh, <laughs> the Die Hard hero's journey for me? And I'll is uh, this is this like the Joseph Campbell? Yes, like the Joseph Campbell denies wheel? the quest and all that. Exactly. So yeah, I mean, it's it's very. Dan Harmon has his own thing like it's the uh, like a distillation of the Joseph Campbell hero's journey that he calls like the story circle. So he just takes Campbell's 17 steps and doesn't like eight steps. I'm a huge believer in this kind of thing. Tim, the fact that you were so skeptical about whether or not Die Hard is doing this kind of thing is exactly the reason that it does it so well, because ideally, if you're doing the steps right, it's like magic. The audience doesn't even know you're doing stuff behind the scenes. But meanwhile, I mean, it just perfectly adheres to a lot of these steps. You got uh, the return across the threshold is the biggest one that always comes back to me because the return across the threshold in this movie is literally John McClane swinging back into the building and crashing through like the glass of the windows forms a physical threshold. You've got great examples like uh, at the very end. Um, Oh, fuck. I'm, I should have written this down. You know, I knew okay. I was coming. So my, my basic understanding of this is like most stories like where there's a protagonist and he's a hero. He goes on a journey. He's he's reluctant to change. He goes on a journey on this journey. He learns. He grows. He returns to the world from which he departed a changed person and applies what he learned to his, his original circumstances and is better off for it, basically, in the short run. Yeah. And so the thing that I never really got about this in Die Hard is that him and his wife, the whole catalyst at the beginning of this is that him and his wife are fighting. And I'm sure there's other reasons to do this because it definitely it sets up the whole last name thing, which is why she's able to lay low so long. So that's really cool. Like there's so much setup in this movie that is like, God, like they don't even have to do it. But I mean, it's just like above and beyond. Like at the like the first thing he's he's meeting uh, 
the boss and he's like hell of a building you have here and he's like it will be if we ever finish it there's like 10 floors under construction and that's just so that when he's up there fighting in the construction we know that's what it's it's like all set like every line at the beginning of this movie is setting something up including being barefoot mm-hmm. all this stuff hi mclean the last name all that stuff his relationship with his wife is like my biggest confusion in this movie because we don't actually see him and her reconcile at the end in any way like he's still a New York cop. She's still living in L.A. We don't see him recon- reconcile. The thing I didn't I remembered on this rewatch or saw on this rewatch is he does give a pretty interesting monologue to the cop outside about his wife and how he's she's always heard him say, I love you, but she's never heard me say, I'm sorry. Bro, and I was like, OK, so the that's goddess. the thing. That's the thing that was missing is the moment when he like, yeah, confesses everything to it. But we still don't see him reconcile with her. In my mind, I mean, I think it's implied when they're walking out of the building at the end, sharing one blanket. They're clearly going to go back to, uh, you know, to the to to their house together. Yeah, I feel like. And as we know from Die Hard 2, come on. Okay, Die Hard 2 is not canon as far as our podcasts go. (laughs) (laughs) The so I think in this specific case, the reconciliation pretty much happens in the beginning. That's also part of the details they set up up top when she says, like, you know, the kids would love to have you, you know, stay in the house with us tonight. And he kind of looks at her and goes, oh, yeah, would they? And then she goes, I would, too. That's kind of the moment where it's like she was you can tell she was surprised that he actually got on the plane and came here. You know, um, she's seeing him again. She's kind of overwhelmed with emotion. He's overwhelmed with emotion. It's implied that they're going to go, you know, home together tonight and maybe try to work things out. But the biggest thing in general with John McClane and his wife in this movie is sacrifice. It's the idea that he coming into the movie was not willing to make sacrifices for his wife. She got the job out in L.A. Uh, He tells Argyle basically like, yeah, I didn't think she was going to cut it. I figured she'd come running back to me in New York. So he just kind of let her take this job and move on. And he was just waiting for her to fail. He wasn't willing to sacrifice what he had in New York for her. But throughout the course of the movie, he's willing to sacrifice everything for her. So it's him. I have a question. Do you guys think that if the if there was no heist you know if uh, no terrorists no hans gruber no bad guys enter do you think john mcclain is on a flight back to new york like christmas morning like yes. do you think they actually yes. work through it at no. all no, he, no. he leaves the next day not at, not all. at all like <laughs> that's a, that's the thing that's weird to me about his like change right is that the thing he does is his job he he's a new york cop like his main thing is being a new york cop and then he goes and he like fights a bunch of bad guys and somehow he's changed because of he's just because he's doing the thing that he we already know he can do which is kick ass like i don't know it's it's weird to me but but <laughs> i think it still makes for a compelling action movie i think okay so the first big thing when he commits the adventure is we see him he's in uh that like office suite where he was cleaning up we see him from his perspective the camera jumps to his perspective we see him look at the terrorists that are coming into the building and look at the exit and look back at the terrorists and he does end up making a run for the exit to escape from the terrorists but he doesn't go down to escape which i think the actual like cop procedure would be to get out of the building call for backup and come back in uh he goes up he commits to trying to solve this himself okay so that's something i think that's a big situation where he takes it on himself he could have just left his wife there to die and run away, but he did chose to stay. Here's my thought. Here's what I think happened upon rewatch is that he sees his wife being kidnapped and he goes, wow, this is a great opportunity for me to get my wife back by destroying the building where she works, making sure her boss is killed, making sure the number two Ellis is killed. And then I can swoop and save my wife, convince her to move back to New York and I'll be happier ever after. I think he was a selfish prick who did everything he could. <laughs> we watched him watch the boss die. We know he hey, let wait, there's die. nothing that he could do in that situation. <laughs> Come on. There's nothing he could do. <laughs> Come on, like even even uh, what's his name? Sergeant Al Powell says there's nothing he could have do to save that man. I mean, Ellis put himself in that situation. Ellis on his fucking cocaine high got himself killed. Like I, uh, no way. Yeah. And he couldn't have saved Takagi either. Like, Hell no. you know, he's there's no way. Come on. Well, the he cops also was right. one man. The cops were right. 
Uh, here's so we, you're siding with like the, <laughs> the, the, the dude from Breakfast Club. Is your, yeah, uh, he's Principal, Principal Rooney is Tim's hero in this movie. <laughs> Do you know what Principal Rooney was right too? Those kids were acting up. I don't understand how it's so hard about the tension. You you put your head down, you do your work, you think about what you did. And these kids are messing around the whole time. This is crazy. It's insane that they would disobey orders like that. Wow, you should have another <laughs> podcast where you're just going through old movies and being like, actually, this like the trunch bull was was right. Jesus Christ. That's gonna Siding be the fucking, with Hydra. Yeah. He's gonna go back. It's like when you watch Ghostbusters now and the main yeah. human <laughs> villain is a guy from the EPA. Yeah, yeah. Actually, like, the EPA was just doing their job. Actually, I'm on the mayor's side here. <laughs> <laughs> the mayor is just trying to get reelected. <laughs> should have put those dogs down. It's true. Real change doesn't happen until your second term, Kevin. We all know that. Yeah. On uh, on the show, we have a couple categories we go through. One of them, uh, one of my favorites, is when did you know? Uh, here's a, a when did you know that I had is when did you know that Bruce Willis's character was a blue collar guy from New York because <laughs> <laughs> they they sprinkle in a ton of details up top that I love. There's one I know I noticed this time where they're at this. He's at this party and he takes a fancy drink from a tray, takes a sip. Ugh, shakes his head and puts it back. <laughs> He's like, what is this? This isn't Bud Light. Dude, the best one of all, incredible detail, uh, is he gets picked up by Argyle on the limo. Argyle's like, hey, yeah, I don't really know what to do here. It's my first time driving. He's like, hey, it's my first time riding in one. And we smash cut to him sitting shotgun in the fucking limo. <laughs> what a great detail. That tells you everything about this guy. Uh, I also love the second he's getting off the plane, he sees like a girl run to a guy getting who's also getting off the same plane as him. The girl jumps into his arms and kisses him. And it's like, oh, that's nice. This couple is reuniting. They haven't seen each other. And he looks at them, shakes his head and just goes, California, as if like <laughs> human intimacy can only happen on the West Coast. It's just like that would never fucking happen in New York City, baby. Oh, yeah. People on the West Coast are weaker. Because they're warm yeah. weather. They haven't had to, you know, go through a perpetual cold. Yeah. <laughs> Where men hug other men and it's disturbing. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, that <laughs> moment absolutely has not aged well. I was thinking about, I can. I mean, I, it, but it's not, it's not same sex. It's a blonde woman and her boyfriend. And oh, it's just like California. He does it again at the party. A dude oh, kisses him on the cheek and he like kind of freaks out. Oh, Oh, right. I forgot. He's about like that. California. <laughs> it's like California yeah. is his explanation when he's very judgmental. He's like, <laughs> oh, that couple at the uh, airport probably living in sin. I don't see a wedding ring. Look at these guys. He's very conservative. John McClane. Not yeah, a good guy, just, John McClane. That's my take. He's, he's a cool Irish wife. Catholic. <laughs> hey, listen, a cap for everybody except John McClane. John McClane's the only cop I like. <laughs> Here's the thing, John McClane, uh, I realized this viewing of the movie, John McClane's not a cop. He is a fucking psycho that got a badge so he could do whatever the fuck he wanted to. This dude, he puts the dead body in the elevator and writes, now I have a machine gun, ho, ho, ho. That's like a fucking Saw movie move. Hey, come on. I mean, he's one guy. He's against 15 guys. He's trying to like do some psychological, get some psychological advantage as well, because he knows he's at an immense physical and, 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 and you know, technological disadvantage. He's got to use every weapon in his arsenal. If, if sure, if that involves tapping into his deep, dark, like sociopathy that he buries deep down, you know, you got to do it. Uh, yeah, it. I, he did get his ass handed to him one on one with the first terrorist he fought. I mean, he really, he really got rough. It wasn't up for there. those stairs. Thank God for those stairs. I know. I I like that he starts killing them after, like he ramps up. Like the first guy, he could have shot, and he doesn't. He's like, I'm still a cop. I'm a good guy. And then as the movie progresses, he just gets more and more. He just like instantly starts blowing these guys away because he's like learned like I can't fuck around here. The stakes are too high. It's like great. Like he does kind of he does change in like really awesome ways. I mean, this is just a great movie. <laughs> and he's got to really let go movie. of his New York cop ways and adapt to the situation, Tim. But then what ends up saving him in the very end is this Love fucking New York Christmas. pistol <laughs> that he still had with him. And Christmas tape. And Christmas tape. The spirit of Christmas really saves the day in this movie. 
I also <laughs> from Hans Gruber, that fucking Grinch. I also love how the cop, how Winslow, the cop or whatever is like downstairs and like his and Winslow's story arc is that one time he shot oh. a kid and he's been afraid to shoot anyone since. <laughs> and, and then at the end, he gets to shoot somebody. And even when Argyle pulls up, he starts like he's going to shoot Argyle. And it's like, oh, I see another kid. Like, I'm just picturing <laughs> everyone, everyone looks like a kid to him. So he just keeps like <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really a confusing arc. That's the one that's aged the worst. That's yeah. the yeah. single thing in this movie that's aged the worst is that like he learns how to be a trigger happy cop again <laughs> after killing an innocent child. That one's not that and one's every, not good. Everyone's like, good for you, man. We needed this. We needed you back out there <laughs> shooting people. Just in case there are any seven foot tall Russian dudes. Oh, man. Matt, Matt, what's your favorite thing about this movie? Do you, can you boil it down to a single thing? What's your thesis on this movie? Why is it worth us talking about every single year? Oh my god! I mean, there that's there is no single thing. It's that's it's just it's good. It's it's just a, with the exception of that one story arc that we just talked about. It's basically a perfect action movie. The characters are fun. The acting's great. The script is so quippy and fun, and not like you know. Maybe this is not the right podcast for me to say this on, but it's not annoying in that like Marvel way. It's like actually funny. How good dare quips. you? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Shut down the Zoom, Tim. And, and, and um, yeah, and like the, the fuck, it, the, the director, John McTiernan, he's, he's just like a dude who knows how to like, you know, as fans of action movies, you know, there's been various eras of action movies and like, they're definitely like when we were sort of in high school, like post Jason Bourne, it was all very like quick cut, shaky cam, never know like the geography of like the space you're in. Um, and I was always more of a fan of like old, older action movies. And I love like Jackie Chan martial arts movies. Cause those are like, let's have a wide shot and like see the space and like, let's actually, cause, and obviously that's a specific case. Cause Jackie Chan is like an athlete. And it's so, like, let's see him do these like amazing, amazing physical stunts, but like a movie like Die Hard, it's a, but it's a similar thing where it's like, let's, let's know where everyone is. Let's choreograph this action. Like it's, it's very, it's not, you're never confused as to what's going on, which is like great. And like, that's one of the reasons why this movie still holds up, uh, you know, despite, 30 years of advance in special effects and stuff. It's still great because the direction is so good. And the cinematography is amazing. Jan de Bont is the cinematographer on this movie who then went on to like direct speed and be a great action director by himself. So it's just like a perfect like grouping of talented people in front of the camera, behind the camera, you know, the writers, it's just, it's just so fucking good. And then, it's a perfect action movie by itself. And then you get to like, you put Christmas stuff on top of it, which is like, it's nice that it comes back around every year because of the Christmas stuff. And like, it absolutely could work if it was a party that had nothing to do with Christmas. You know, the Christmas stuff is just like the sprinkles on top that like give it a little more, I don't know, flavor. Why do you I think it. it was set at Christmas? I don't know. Maybe the book. <laughs> yeah, it's based on a book that was set at Christmas. Um, I don't know. I guess it's just an excuse to like get everyone in this one place at one time and also like have the rest of the building be empty, have most of the cops be off duty, have like the city sort of be shut down more or less. And so it's like a quieter night and everyone is in this one place. So it like I feel like that it, it, it skips a, little, a couple steps there. Word. It's just, it's interesting to me because this came out in 1988 and the very next year, Lethal Weapon came out, which is also mm -hmm. set at Christmas, which is too close for the Lethal Weapon team to have seen this and been like, we got to make ours be at Christmas too. So it's just interesting to me that these came as a one-two punch and they're both terrific yeah. action movies that just happen to be set at Christmas. Well, Lethal, uh, Lethal Weapon was written by Shane Black, who I think every single movie he writes is set at Christmas. Like Lethal Weapon, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, Iron Man Three. You guys love Marvel, you know, like all the all the all of his um, Long Kiss Goodnight set at Christmas. He just loves setting action movies at Christmas. I don't. I mean, that doesn't have anything to do with Die Hard, but Shane Black is like that's his trademark. 
Right action movie, set it at Christmas. The Nice Guys, also set at Christmas. That's another Shane Black. That's insane. I never put that together. Yeah. It, it feels like they use Christmas in like two different ways. Kind of where like all the things you listed with Die Hard, which is like, man, they're so good at like up, up top. They give you all of these little details that seem like they're unimportant, but are definitely like like mentioned later, like throughout the thing. It's like, hey, we got to turn off the power. We can't. Everyone here is home for Christmas. The building's empty. Why? Everyone's gone for Christmas. You're the last ones here. Security. Why isn't there any security here? Well, it's Christmas. You know, we're on the night shift or whatever it is. You know, like it keeps coming up at the end when he tapes the stuff to his back. He's getting the tape from like a cart that is the packing on it. You know, when they open the safe, they're playing Christmas music. Like Christmas is like prevalent and diehard the whole time. And it kind of like raises the stakes somehow and i'm not really sure exactly how it raises the stakes because it's not a family thing which is what i was going to say about lethal weapon which is like christmas is like murtaugh's like got his whole family there and it seems like christmas is like raises the stakes for the family man if that yeah. makes sense and Die Hard doesn't mm-hmm. have that same like family element but for somehow the fact that it's christmas still makes everything more important i mean i guess he's trying to get home to his kids there's like all that kind of stuff but Man, it's just it's just interesting. It's just really good. Yeah, it's just it's great. I mean, I do think that like. Christmas does raise the stakes, right? Because like holidays, whether or not this is true or not, holidays are like more special than like a normal day. So it's like every emotion is heightened every like it's. Yeah, I don't know. You're right. I don't know exactly how it raises the stakes, but it does seem to. Yeah. Also, it's interesting that this movie is the first movie I can remember that like was Beethoven's Ode to Joy always like associated with Christmas? I don't know. It, but don't that's know. the one that yeah. plays when they open the safe, right? Yeah, yeah. Da, 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 which has now become a running theme through all all the Die Hard movies. They they keep coming back to Ode to Joy. It feels Christmassy, right? Like that's what I, I thought yeah. when I'm listening to it. I'm like, this is Christmas music. My first thought is always that it used to be in the nineties, the stars theme song. Like movies, movies, stars has movies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was unaware of that. Of that. Oh, it's it's deep in the brain. Yeah, there is I don't know. Maybe it's even just the that irony, you know? This movie has a lot mm. of um a lot of like strong ironic contrast with like you know this big action movie it's set at christmas time he's a new york cop but he's in la um he's like a very very blue collar guy and this is like the most white collar crime they're trying to pull off possible bearer bonds like i mean a lot has been said about the plot of this movie but it's it's the most preposterously like bureaucratic plot I think it's like this and what they're trying to pull off in office space are like the most white collar crimes <laughs> I can think of. But it's also like Hans Gruber is a really white collar villain, yeah. you know, too. So it's like that contrast of of blue collar John McClane with like Hans Gruber, who's like uh, talking, you know, when Alexander saw the breadth of his domain, he wept for there were no more worlds to conquer, which is a great line, which actually, if you look it up, it's not he's not quoting anything. That is just original from Die Hard. Is it really? Um, <laughs> yeah. No, wow. I said that and MK was like not believing me. And then she like did a bunch of research and she's like, oh, it does seem like that quote was made up for Die Hard, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> which is awesome. And but also like he's, you know, he's talking about his nice suits. Yeah. Um, I was just going to bring that so up. So it's just like nice Hans suit. Gruber in this beautiful suit and then John McClane like filthy uh, sort of, you know, white undershirt and no shoes and you know just completely blue collar god the fucking the fact that the impressive thing to him in that line is the like john phillips london i heard <laughs> arafat buys there he's like <laughs> he's trying to buy his suits where yes or arafat buys his suit i do that's another funny thing is there's a lot of like 80s sort of geopolitics sprinkled into this movie there's a lot of like Japanese like take coming to America overtaking American industry stuff including like a really strange line that the the boss says where he's like Mr. Takagi is just like well we felt bad for Pearl Harbor so we thought we should bring you some VCRs or something oh <laughs> and it's just like what the <laughs> fuck that is crazy <sighs> but yeah a lot of a lot uh, of weird 80s geopolitics and some some really nice uh Time magazine. 
Asian Dawn references. So I got to ask this. We've uh, we've talked about when did you know we've listed a lot of thieves for this movie. I mean, this movie is full of thieves. Do you have any beefs? Is there anything about this movie that you're beefing with? Is it just a perfect movie? I mean, you got I guess I in my younger days, I would have said it is a perfect movie. But I, I mean, you do have to, like, take issue with Sergeant Al Powell's whole story arc about, like, I need to learn how to pull my gun and kill people again (laughs) after like, you should not be on the force anymore. If you just shot an unarmed kid, like in, in the days we live in now, that is just, that's, it's hard to look past that one thing. So that would be the, that would be the beef. Yeah. I I think that's obviously a clear one. The one that always comes up to me too, is just, I think you might hate me saying this. I think it's a little bit too long. I think How we can trim you? a little bit off <laughs> this movie. I don't you? think we need to see the drama in the newsroom that involves a news van getting there. If oh, a news van shows up, that's we so get fun, it. though. Yeah, that guy is so fun. The guy from Ghostbusters. <laughs> the he's Helsinki blast, joke is just, one of my favorites. It's Walter. Yeah. He's like Helsinki, Helsinki, Sweden, and the guy goes Finland, yeah. and then he just looks at the camera. <laughs> like, and you get that amazing visual joke where it's like cuts from the newsroom, and it's like. Right now, the terrorists and the hostages have started a bonding experience and they're becoming dependent on another. And then it just smash cuts to them, like dragging Ellis's dead body out of the. Out of the- oh, people scream. Oh, it's yeah. so good. God. I mean, I feel like how, what's the runtime? It's, it's two hours and 12 hours, minutes. Yeah. Two hours, 12. I mean, I guess. I guess, I guess, you know, that is long. That's long. I'm a long, I mean, I'm a proponent of like 90 minute movies are perfect, but it's just, this movie's so chock full of wonderful things. It's just like, it'd be hard to say what to cut. Kind of my beef in the past has been like, there's a lot of time when John McClane isn't doing anything, mm-hmm. but I've kind of, gr- over time, I've kind of grown to like it more and more. Like there's just scenes where he he like blows up an elevator and then he sits and just talks to the cop on this walkie doggie for like half an hour and they're just gabbing. (laughs) And then like, you know, then we see some scenes with the cop and then we cut back and John McClane's found a Twinkie and he's like, oh, man, what's in this yellow dye? Whatever. It's like there's just a lot of like kind of him just hanging out in a building. But it kind of now makes me think of kind of like The Walking Dead or something where you're like, yeah, sure, the world's ending, but also like I can't actually be doing anything right. I can't be murdering every zombie in the world right now or like. Or like, you know, in like action movies when they have somehow the hero and the bad guy are related and somehow they're at dinner together and they have to be civil towards each other. And you're in the back of my mind. I'm just like, why can't they just kill each other right now? And it's like, no, they have to have this. It's like it's kind of like that. I've kind of grown to enjoy it. Like the kind of like because all those moments are like pregnant pauses and he's like waiting for the cops to do something and then the cops fuck it up and then he has to compensate for it. And then and then like uh uh, what's his face tells him like, Hey man, we've got this. And he's like, okay, I'll let you do it. And then they don't have it. And then he's like, fuck, now I have to step in. And, like he keeps like wanting to stop and like tan this over to somebody else. And then he keeps getting pulled back in. It's like really cool. The more I watch it, the more I've like grown to really like it. it does. I think those are the, those are the things to on rewatch that you like too. you know, yeah. like the action scenes, you, you see them and you see them and you see them. And it's like the stuff that you really enjoy rewatching is those like character moments. Man, exactly. Sure. It almost the one thing I will say about the long run time is it almost lets it feel like it's happening in real time. Like, I don't know if yes. there are any real like significant time cuts in this movie. Um, so that is nice. Yeah, but that's still, cool. I don't know. You can trim 13 minutes off this somewhere. You can get it down to sub two hours. Perfect movie. <laughs> we'll trim off the credits. Yeah. 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 Take the credits off for sure. Any final thoughts, Matt? Well, I guess just thank you so much for having me uh, to talk about Die Hard again. I love it. It's my favorite movie of all time. I can't wait to, you know, talk more next year. Absolutely. <laughs> Thrilled to have you with us, man. Anything you want to plug? Um, Pod Cusack? Pod Cusack is coming back season two starts January 2022. Stay Ooh. tuned. We got yes. some big, big, uh, big movies left. Yes. Hell yeah. Did you do that one where like they're in Asia on the Great Wall or whatever yet that I saw Roku Ooh, not yet. pushing? <laughs> not yet, but that's coming. You'll be on that one. Dude, I cannot wait. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. Uh, this has been Nerdy for 30 uh, on behalf of myself and Kevin and Matt. Thank you so much for listening. Stay nerdy. Merry Christmas. Bye. Bye. <laughs>